My name is Chad Jacobson. I'm here from Denver, Colorado, a brewery there called Crooked Stave Artisan Beer Project. And today I'm presenting on mixed culture fermentations and uh, botanomyces and the use of it in mixed culture fermentations and how to be able to work with those uh, in your brewery and in your brew house. Uh, kind of as a show of hands to gauge the audience, how many people here are already making Britannomyces or wild and sour beers? Good amount, that's what I figured. Um, most. How many people here are mostly on the, the production side of things? Just where some good interest is. Okay. So as I start out, I will, I'll follow along with these a little bit, uh, but in general, honestly, I prefer to go more off the cuff and be able to, to answer questions. Um, if people are interested, we can get much deeper into things uh, instead of listening to me say Britannomyces over and over again. Um, the less I say it, the better, uh, then people stay awake. Whereas if you say Britannomyces enough, it seems like people start to fall asleep after a little bit. So hopefully I can, can keep you guys for the whole uh, 45 minutes or so. So in, in producing sour beers, I think it's probably something that most people have come across is the fact that they're different than, obviously, they're different than the way you approach a normal beer, especially from the brew house. Everyone kind of has a different dogma on, on recipe production, on beers, on how you make them. And for me, I believe that a lot of things can really be taken care of in the brew house. And that's important in consideration for various wild beers, sour beers, and really every beer you make. So it's really crucial to think about the mouthfeel and to kind of think about the, the network that's gonna happen in the beer as it ages over time. In general, the beers that we're talking about today are gonna to age sometimes in stainless, sometimes then afterwards in the package, but also in oak for an extended period of time. And during that time, you're gonna have a lot of secondary metabolites and production that occurs that's going to, to change the beer and not always for the better. And so kind of what I'm talking about is thinking about that, that finished product and how you get there and thinking about how you want that to taste. I doubt most people set out to make a, a thin, flabby, watery beer because the wild yeast eats through everything and there's really nothing left for this sort of base, this backbone to be able to, to live upon. So that's kind of those the brew house considerations we'll get into. Uh, and then just looking at different ways to use you know, primary fermented with Britannomyces versus primary fermented with a mixed culture versus secondary bread, secondary mixed culture, and just kind of aspects. And again, that goes into what you're setting out on brew day all the way through. How long are you thinking the beer is going to lay down? What is it that sort of the final goal is for this beer? And then even after you put in all that thought and consideration, at the end of the day, a lot of times the beer still tells you what it wants to be or what it wants to do. So it's kind of the the art and the science behind these beers. And it's fascinating beers to brew because there is, a, I think, a little bit more art in some of these beers and, and really figuring out you know, where they're going. So brew house and brew day considerations. I mean, obviously, everyone considers the raw materials and their, their influence. You know, water can be important, maybe not quite as important as I would say it is to a pilsner, for instance, looking at your water profile there. But again, it's still extremely important to be able to hit those pHs in your mash tun uh, through kettle and through knockout. You know, even if we're using wild yeast, it, it's really important still to look at you know what the pH is of what we're pitching that yeast, what our cell counts are when we're pitching it. You know, all the same things that you would consider for Saccharomyces. Um, now that might be a little more commonplace, but it was really interesting ten years ago, and just kind of the the thoughts that oh, if you don't add oxygen and you try to primary ferment with bread, it's better because you get these. Uh, these nuanced flavors or these different stress factor flavors. Uh, no, it, it's a yeast. It, it likes oxygen. It, it wants to replicate. It wants to ferment. So putting it through stressful conditions in the end is not in any way tied to secondary metabolites of the yeast. So if there are characteristics, for instance, that you see from, you know, maybe a stress-induced or anything like that, it's, it's not really from the stress-induced. It's just kind of where that Britannomyces gets to its, its equilibrium as it produces flavors. We'll talk about that a little bit further on. So hops as well, fruit, different characteristics that are going to age out and create different flavors. Fruit will have a big impact, especially on sour beer production. So if you have a really acidic beer, you don't necessarily want to tie it with really acidic fruits. You want something that'll uh, play up in character. So the difference between like peaches and raspberries and apricots. And then fermentation type. So primary fermented, stainless for a soak, and secondary fermented with oak. 
so brewing techniques and talking about that there's a lot, sort of the dogma is you can take care of so much in the brew house. So things downstream that you're looking at that can really take a lot longer or can help that beer kind of have that beer matrix of things you want to be able to, to hold up against the backbone of the beer and to be there for those organisms. So some people think of this as, as oats or raw wheat. And, you know, if you're talking about, for instance, spontaneous beers, um, so some of the, like, lambics, where there are 60, 40 of, of raw wheat, that raw wheat puts a lot of protein in there, so the protein that those organisms are able to, to feed off and continue to live off and, and consume those amino acids. Uh, but it's also going to put really long-chain dextrins in that are going to be able to feed the yeast and feed the bacteria over time. More of the yeast than the bacteria. The bacteria really work off more simple sugars. And that's not necessarily, that's not needed for all beers. It works for those types of beers. So depending on the final outcome of the beer that you're looking to brew, you can really, you know, work everything back to brew day. So if it's a hoppy Brett beer you're looking to make, or if it is a, you know, sessionable light sour, depending on how quick you want it to sour versus, you know, how long you want that to be sustained, all of those things kind of go into that consideration within the brew house. And that's going to have considerations for whether to rest or not, rest temperatures and time. The, the rest temperature is one that I think is really important with wild and sour beers. Britannomyces... It's a wonderful yeast. It's a great organism because in a way, we like to think of it, it's kind of like a soft pillow. It's antioxidative, so it'll really scrub out oxygen. It helps beers age for so long because of that and not getting those oxidative characteristics. But at the same time as a yeast, if you give it too much oxygen, it'll produce a little bit of acetic acid. Also, given the raw materials. So in, in wine production, they think a lot about the, the raw materials of what they start with because that's really what creates all the flavors down line. In, in beer, we, we tend to think about, okay, I'm going to use this, uh, this specialty Pilsner malt for my Pilsner. Oh, but I've just used two row for these. Or I'm going to use this, you know, really not golden promise for this English ale. But yet when it comes to thinking about it for, for wild and sour beers, the consideration of what happens to the malt is not always there but also the consideration of what's coming with the malt. So those temperatures that you sparge at, for instance, and those raw materials that come out, Britannomyces will, will really kind of play around with those. And so that's sometimes where you start to get uh, some of the synergistic acids, some of these basically uh, phenolic compounds, so sparging too warm. So for us with wild and sour beers, we'll sparge it a little bit, lighter temp. Sometimes we'll have a little bit thicker mash bed because, uh, again, looking at kind of that, that ADF, so the attenuation that you're seeing in these beers, you're not going to, by making a real complex, kind of complex malt base and, and leaving a lot of dextrins in, you're not going to help the beer as much in the long run, but at the same time, you don't want to thin it out. So it's kind of a, a fine balance there. So primary fermentation, stainless for soak. And so here's just kind of looking at the different ways to be able to, I wonder if there's a spotter on here. Uh, the different ways to be able to, uh, is everyone able to see this? It's kind of bright. Kind of, yeah, cool, awesome. Uh, yeah, again, I, I think I always really like to talk about the beer, and, and especially with these wild and sour beers, really, you know, for, for most of us, it's not, it's not production, it's not the everyday beer, so it's not the beer that we're making all the time where we're thinking about our turns, we're thinking about our efficiency. Instead, hopefully, it's kind of one of the, the brews that we get to think about, we get to plan out. Uh, I feel like I never get to spend enough time, you know, thinking about new beers. It's like, okay, I spent five minutes thinking about this new beer. Okay, let's go. Let's do that. And then I spend all the rest of the time worrying about all these other things. I instead, I like to try and approach these beers thinking about, you know, what is that final beer? What do I want it to taste like? What does it look like? You know, how does it smell? And really getting to, uh, to work backwards. And I think that works really well with these beers. And so we have a couple of different methods at Cricket's Dave of, of how we're using Britannomyces in the wild uh, really our mixed culture, and it just speaks to what the beer is. So our, for us, actually, our number one beer that we produce is a beer called Sour Rosé. Um, so we put it in, it's a six-pack can, and the idea is really to be able to push traditionally fermented sour beers and to be able to educate consumers. So they're 100% uh, fermented in the oak fooders that you can see on the right there. They primary ferment in there. 
they move back. We bring in whole fruit, raspberries, and blueberries. And f basically from brew day to cannings, uh, right around 11, 12 weeks. And it's just consistently the way we've built it so that they've all got the time and we can be emptying different fooders each and every week to be able to do it. For sour rosé, that's, that's really important. We want it to be an oak. We want to be able to say that this is all oak fermented from the beginning. At the same time, what we consider some of our more approach approachable Britannomyces beers, we like to produce in stainless steel. And the reason for that is, you know, a lot of it started from the time when we were producing these 100% Britannomyces beers. Uh, it was called the Wild Wild Brett series. And, you know, we really didn't know what is a Brett beer. It, it's not really a, it's still not a well-defined category or what they are. It's not a category. It's, it's kind of art. It's kind of what you make it. You know, when you, when you talk about a Pilsner or a Porter or a Stout, it's very defined kind of style categories kind of come to mind. When you say a Brett beer, you know, some people are going to think sour. Some people are going to think a barrel-aged saison. I mean, it's really kind of all over the place. And so in order to kind of create that introduction and, and introduce people to Britannomyces beers, we felt that, okay, for these ones, stainless steel is a really good way to be able to do that. And so stainless steel, it's great to be able to ferment in. As we all know, it's a superior vessel in every way when it comes to being able to clean, uh, being able to see inside, know what it looks like, knowing the, the fermentation profile, what's coming out, being able to control temperatures, pressure, everything to that extent. Uh, except for, you know, what it, what it doesn't have is that, that complexity you get from wood, and a lot of that's because of that little bit of oxygen, that little bit of influence, the difference, you know, between a, a really large fooder or smaller oak barrels, and kind of that, that character and those differences. So in looking at the 100% Brett beers that we were doing and then Britannomyces mixed culture beers that didn't have bacteria, you know, we wanted more subtle, lighter, softer Britannomyces characters. We also wanted to be able to produce the beers in a way that was maybe more uh, approachable from a brewing stance. Um, it's pretty hard to tie up a fermenter for four, six, eight weeks when you could be turning over beers that could be two, three weeks and be able to routinely turn those out. So the idea was to make something that, that worked for us from a production standpoint so that we could make these beers, that we could make Britannomyces beers, but yet we didn't need 20 fermenters just so we could make 100 barrels of beer a year. And so the primary fermentation, uh, and this kind of segues a little bit into, there's not a lot in this talk about uh, the lab side of things. I would argue that quality control and quality processes and being able to monitor your processes throughout this, but also to quantify and qualify really your equipment and production and keeping things segregated from each other is extremely important. Um, that's just another talk, not this one. So don't infect the breweries. Um, at, at Kirk at Save, how we've done this, um, and you've probably heard this before, is that we have basically put three breweries inside of one. So we segregated everything off. Eh, that's really not true. We have indicated everything for what it is and what its use is. So from the brew house into the stainless steel, uh, our stainless cellar, it's all the fermenters that are in there, but we split stuff off. So if it is a fermenter that, uh, say, we'll blend sour beer into to dry hop, it'll have uh, red vinyl stickers on it. Um, FVX is one of them, FV10. If it's for Saccharomyces, uh, we use the Saccharomyces only, so Sar Saccharomyces service here essentially, and, and our lagers, it's uh, green. So we kind of use the term green clean, and then Brett black and red sour. So everything all the way through from, from the fermenter, all the way through all the gla uh, gaskets, there's all placards, every single piece, everything is taped with like green electrical tape or is noted with green on it so that you know all the way through the process that's just for IPA or Pilsner or Porter. Uh, for the Britannomyces and Saccharomyces blends or the Britannomyces only blends, everything is black all the way through. So even the hoses are segregated out, which side they go on, uh, where they're stored, what strainer is used, which hard pipe they go through, which bright tanks they go to, which canning equipment they're on or bottling equipment they're on, and then vice versa for the red sour as well. All the parts from sight glasses, yeah, you name it. Um, it gets it gets monotonous, and it means that you have boards in multiple places with equipment hung on it, organized, all sort of broken out. And then each day, depending on processes that you're doing, qualifying that. So doing ATP, 
um, doing micro checks. Uh, if you have PCR, uh, trying to run PCR as well on bright tanks before packaging and different stuff like that. So that's about as much as I'll get into how important it is to qualify everything so that you know you're keeping it segregated. And then as long as you are, then you have your different processes and all your different equipment for how you're deciding to go about making those beers. So we do actually a fair amount now of, of Pilsner uh, and IPA at the brewery. The two of them combined don't quite equal sour rosé, which is nice. We started as a sour brewery and we'd like to, to stick with being a sour brewery. Um, so maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. Um, so yeah, so little little overview on Britannomyces. Hopefully not too much so it doesn't bore you. Um, Britannomyces are decora. Decora being basically the sporulating form that could sexually reproduce and Britannomyces being really the form that we work with where it's uh, daughter ce mother cells budding into daughter cells and reproducing uh, through asexual reproduction. Two unique and important enzymes in Britannomyces, alpha-glucosidase and beta-glucosidase. Uh, alpha glucosidase is the one really responsible. It's both inter and extracellular, responsible for that extra attenuation that we see. So it's capable of, of attacking some of those really long oligosaccharides and cleaving them off um, like one three six bond linkage at a time, so that it gets smaller and smaller and is actually producing its more uh, like glucose, simpler sugar for it that it's going through and consuming. And then beta glucosidase, uh, which is kind of responsible for what's been becoming more and more popular as people talk about it, uh, which is like de novo synthesis, so the production of compounds uh, through means that basically before they were not, they were not aromatic, they were not volatile, they are attached to a sugar compound. Um, so you hear a lot about it with, uh, with hops is the big one and people talking about, about that. Britannomyces is a yeast actually has the, well, some of the strains have the beta glucosidase enzyme. And so it's able to do all sorts of things in, in fruit and spices and in hops as well. And flavor and aroma compounds, it's definitely the most significant aspect of Britannomyces yeast and their ability to really influence the fermentations and what they do. It's a really, really fascinating yeast. When you think about Saccharomyces, essentially, and you're, you're pitching Saccharomyces through fermentation, through that first you know, 24, 48, up, up to 72 hours, but really in that 24 to 48 hours, you have all of the primary metabolites that are produced. And they're produced, they're directly linked to fermentation uh, and, and through those production of compounds. And that's where they get to, and then that's where they stay. The longer you age a beer on Saccharomyces, Cervicier, you're not really, you're not seeing a change. You're not seeing these different enzymes that are taking the compounds originally produced and changing them. Whereas Britannomyces, on the other hand, is, is really interesting. And the different strains, I talk about Britannomyces singularly, but really, Every single strain is different, and the genomic diversity is huge. So discovering more strains, finding more strains, and what they what they do is, uh, yeah, kind of up up to each person because they're the the possibility for different strains and for strains that act different ways or produce different flavors um, can really really be expanded by basically as many strains you can find. Each one seems to have these different different characteristics. So lumping them together is, is kind of hard, but speaking in general terms. And so Britannomyces, whether it's used in primary or secondary, it's really interesting. It's like it, it comes to the party and it's like, yeah, I don't like you, so I'm going to split you up. You're cool. I'm going to make more of you. And it's really, really fascinating because it takes those esters that have already been produced and either rips them apart and gets rid of them or takes them, rearranges them, and makes new ones. And so it's kind of one of the neat things that it, you know, no matter what base beer you brew or different things, these yeasts kind of get to this equilibrium point where they start to produce basically the amounts and thresholds of flavors that they prefer as a strain. And that's just uh, something that I think is fun to wrap your, your mind around because of the secondary metabolites and how they work. And so therefore, even if you produce beer with a heavy vicin yeast, as an example, and you have a bunch of isoamyl acetate, that's one of the main compounds that Britannomyces just breaks down. So that you have some or none in the beer, eventually you're going to have a very decreased or limited amount. Um, but then there's the esters that it produces. Pretty beer. Uh, I, I like. I, I love using raspberries. I like the color. It's always fun. Uh, so secondary fermentation in oak. So getting into the microorganisms, microorganisms that are present, uh, wild and sour beer. Doing okay on time. 
uh, lactic acid producing, the different species, lactobacillus pediococcus, and acetic acid bacteria, uh, aerobic bacteria. So for us at Crooked Save, this was always, uh, to me, what my focus, what I wanted it to be. Uh, it was always sour beers that I really, really loved. I, I like being able to work with Botanomyces. I like seeing what it does on its own. But to me, it was always about what it brought really to the table when it came to making sour beer. So getting to work with a mixed culture, getting to work with either primary fermented and then secondary in oak or just primary in oak kind of leads us down two different paths and, and the time for which we age those beers as well. So the role of Britannomyces. So as I was talking about, you know, it, the flavor and aroma is really the most significant parts about it. I think something that I go into here in a little bit is that to me, it's still very interesting because sometimes I'll, I'll smell a Brett beer that's been secondary fermented and aged for a while, Brett, and it smells like sour beer. And that's really an odd thing to say in a way because sour beer, sour beer smell is Britannomyces, but it's not necessarily sour. So sometimes you get that because of that Britannomyces characteristic. You think it's going to be sour, and then it's not. It just kind of has this these nuanced Brett characteristics. And I think that's really always, that's important to look at because... It's, it's not Britannomyces that makes a beer sour, it's the lactobacillus and the bacteria uh, that really, that contribute those lactic acids and then secondary metabolites for Britannomyces to be able to produce. Um, I, think it's, I, I think it's still kind of there. It was a really big thing about 10 years ago. Uh, everyone was so interested in these pineapple characteristics in beers and, and wild beers and where it came from. And it was like the new frontier of, of fermentation and looking for that, this pineapple, pineapple, pineapple. And it got to the point where, you know, I, I don't always pick out pineapple in the beers anyways. I think it's easier just to look at it sort of as tropical fruit. But it was this sort of like holy grail of flavors to try to, to get from Britannomyces, which I found so interesting because forever in the wine industry and everywhere, Britannomyces has always been uh, talked about as being horsey, uh, barnyard, all these characteristics, and then all of a sudden, here's all these people talking about pineapple uh, and and where those flavors come from, and those compounds, and and what it's really related to is the ester production. So as we talked about this esterase that different strains of Britannomyces have that has a different affinity for different compounds, and producing ethyl acetate, ethyl lactate, phenethyl acetate, um, but some of the most characteristic ones are these uh, basically taking capric capric acids. Uh, so capric acids, which are known to be kind of goaty, um, which doesn't sound necessarily delicious in your beer. But when the esterase takes those and is able to basically ethylate them to produce ethyl capranoate, ethyl decanoate, that's where you start to get these pineapple, tropical fruit, citrus type characteristics. Um, on that note, I guess it was, it was interesting. We haven't really played around with it a lot. They're different raw materials that sometimes have more or less capric acid. And uh, one of those is buckwheat. And so I've seen a lot of brewers talk about using buckwheat and trying to purposely get uh, some of these, these fatty acids, this higher like C8, C10 uh, fatty acids into the beer or putting them in through other means and seeing if that would create more tropical fruit characteristics. So the role of lactic acid producing bacteria uh, in Britannomyces. So Britannomyces on its own is not a souring organism. Um, it's, it's really responsible for those characteristic flavors, but the bacteria, the lactobacillus, the pediococcus, really work in conjunction with Britannomyces. And to me, I, I find those to be the most, when the two are combined, that you get the most complex flavors. But you also get some of the most refreshing flavors out of sour beer. One of the things that uh, I find can be nice about sour beer, especially depending on, you know, how acidic it is or what level it is, is that to an extent they can be, they can be refreshing. The bacteria and the lactic acid that they produce gives a real similar sensation that CO2 does. So you get this breakout on your tongue, you get that, that kind of deep sensation, and that helps a lot with a lot of the other flavors. It also helps bring a lot to the table for Botanomyces to be able to uh, create esters with and to produce essentially complex aromas and flavors that we don't find in, in beer. So really looking at it from a novel flavor standpoint. Uh, and then there's always going to be, uh, ideally as little as possible, there's some acetic acid, and it, it's always something to, to look at. And those are 
you know, to me, has got a lot to do with production methods. So Britannomyces on its own is going to produce some acetic acid. And some acetic acid is, is really important in, in the blend as well, or just in general in long-age sour beer. If you kind of think about the differences that you'll note a lot from a sort of a, a kettle sour fermented beer, where produce a lot of lactic acid really quickly, there's kind of a difference between like the D and L isomer in the lactic acid that's produced, but you won't really have the acetic acid production in that time. And so the complexity in the acids isn't necessarily the same. You get the big spike in the lactic. Um, in general, you don't always have Britannomyces afterwards, so you won't get those esters and stuff. And that's where, you know, kind of plays around with the difference in the compounds and the characteristics. So the more of those organic acids, kind of the more complexity you get, but that balance is really important and making sure that the acetic acid is at, you know, a, thresh a threshold level that where on its own is, is really below is, is important. So keeping barrels topped up or, you know, watching, watching bungs, just kind of everything into that, that process and knowing that Britannomyces is going to produce some, but ideally there's not too much acetic acid in that culture. So mixed culture in oak, and this had a lot to do with Britannomyces lactic acid and the bacteria working together. In various research, it's also shown that at some of those lower pHs, besides having those esters and those compounds that can get produced by Britannomyces and, and be in the beer, it also helps Britannomyces ferment a little bit more. So if it's for a primary fermentation, you know, either quick souring method or using, you know, a little bit lower pH helps the Britannomyces get through that fermentation. And it's even seen kind of in the in the growth phases of Britannomyces that it goes through that once it once it naturally as well decreases that pH in the beer, primary fermentation through these dioxic growth curves increases. Um, but also, you know, I, we've talked to a lot of a lot of breweries, you know, don't want to introduce, for instance, they're okay with lactobacillus, but don't want to introduce pediococcus. And sometimes that can be because of diacetyl production or ropiness. And Brett definitely helps clean that up. There's probably also usually other wild sac strains or wild yeast strains that are in cultures that are also help kind of consuming that and going through both cleaning up ropey phase, but also cleaning up the diacetyl. And coincidentally, diacetyl is something that helps Britannomyces, especially in primary fermentation, um, get through basically its, its redux phase. It's one of the reasons why it sort of has a hold up in primary fermentation, being able to primary ferment all the way, is it's not able to restore that redox balance. Uh, diacetyl, when that's taken back up by Britannomyces, produces that hydrogen proton and allows it to basically repeat that redox cycle. So the, the role of oak and what it plays, I, I think... I think that you know oak is something that's really well recognized at this point of what it kind of brings to the beer, whether it's producing a barrel aged stout or producing you know wild sour beers or even just a, a barrel fermented saison. And to us, we really look at oak as that sort of that fifth ingredient in the beer. It's a great place for the the organisms to continue to live. We see that as beers ferment in barrels as they go through barrels over time. We definitely hit a phase that over time where they really seem to get better. So those first use in some of those barrels when we're inoculating, whether wine barrels or even whiskey barrels, the first turn through them are always different than what we see as we go through multiple generations. And it's just something to kind of consider in a new program. So when starting a new program, knowing that some of the, those first flavors that are coming out and some of the stuff that you're seeing is not going to is not typical of what the program is going to be like for, for really the rest of life. It really starts to mature. The organisms become much more acclimated to beer um, in some ways to the point where you start getting souring too fast. Going back to raw materials and thinking about how you can take care of stuff in the brew house, for us that means that we increase the IBUs in some beers. So some of our beers have 20 IBUs or more, um, which is funny because in the in the past, when I've given these conversations or given these uh, these talks at seminars, I've really told people like, forget about IBUs; they're unimportant. You don't need to think about them. And now they've become something to us that actually has become important. Uh, in our dark sour, for instance, it can get really, really sour, and so we've really upped those IBUs. First off, it's a almost a nine percent beer, so just being able to even get the IBUs into it in the first place is important. Lower. Uh, um, lower conversion rates, but also then trying to get it higher so that we can keep the beer from just getting way too sour. Definitely 
I think the name of the game is to make complex, balanced beers. Uh, we had, yeah, probably around the 10, eight year, five years ago range even, uh, it was like the, the IBU race or the IBU wars. Everything was about how you could make a 100 IBU beer in the US and then how you could get past that. And it was just this like muscle flexing contest. I'm not sure why anyone would want 100 IBUs in your beer. Um, I'd prefer it to taste good instead of <laughs> scraping IBUs off my tongue, but teach their own. Uh, hopefully, I, I've always said that sour beer would never come that way. So it's never about making the most sour beer. Instead, it's about making the most complex beer. So that's kind of that slant into you know, how you can use IBUs to try to you know, decrease acidity and, and where it gets to. Um, so back to wood, less about hops. Uh, the chemical reactions that happen over time. So that, that fifth ingredient and the barrel kind of playing that, it's a great place for the organisms, great place for the organisms to be able to live, to be able to acclimate to the beer. But then also, you know, it's a good way to be able to get nuanced flavors into the beer. In the beginning when we started, there was a handful of breweries. It's actually a really interesting time. There were it was about 10 breweries in the U.S. that had ever made sour beer, uh, which is strange because now there's like 7,000. Uh, so just a few. Um, but back when there was 10, I thought there was so many already. And so our goal was to really use neutral oak barrels and not to influence the beer based on, okay, this is a Pinot Noir wine barrel or this is a Sauvignon Blanc white wine barrel and choosing that for the styles. Now as all the years have gone by, we've actually kind of changed that and now we'll take a beer that's been aged for 12 months and then sat on raspberries for three months and then we'll move it into a Sauvignon Blanc barrel and kind of give it that last characteristic. So the wood obviously plays a lot of characteristic there in the flavor, um, but it still kind of was always our angle that it was, it was most important for really breathing life into the beer and, and the organisms that were inside of it. And then some interactive and productive reactions, chemical reactions between components of the beer. That's very similar to like with whiskey barrels and some of the lactones and things that you'll continue to pick up the same way that the whiskey was in there would pick those up. So yeah, uh, I think that's kind of the quick and short almost, I would call it, of you know different ideas and different ways to think about working with Britannomyces. Um, for us over the years at Crooked Stave, it's really changed uh, in so many ways. And I think that's one of the fascinating things about working with what I would consider still really a, an emerging style is that, or merging philosophy really of beers is that there's no one way to do something. And so being able to, you know, play around in the lab and look at, you know, growing up Britannomyces yeast and see how it's behaving and then pitching it into various beers. Uh, something we just did recently, I, this almost contradicts what I was saying where I think it's so crucial to think about the raw materials, think about the beer you're brewing and make the recipe to make that wild beer or that sour beer. Uh, Instead, we did a collaboration with friends and we brewed a Hellas. And they really wanted to, they wanted to take a Pilsner, put the Pilsner into 500 liter casks and sour it. Sounds fun. We already made a Pilsner. As, uh, as brewers at the brewery, we really wanted a Hellas to be able to drink and it wasn't something we'd made yet. So we kind of changed the, the angle of the collaboration. We're like, well, let's, let's make a Hellas. That way we can drink half of it and barrel aged the other half. Um, and that is what happened. We, we drank half the batch, it was gone, and then we wished we hadn't put it in barrels. Uh, fast forward 10 months, we were happy we put it in barrels. It was really fun, but it was also really interesting because beers, especially as you develop your culture, you start to get that house culture. And so drinking this oak-aged mixed culture Hellas, which I'm pretty sure is just a sour beer, uh, you drink it and it, it really just had this crooked stave house flavor, like, yep, that's crooked save cultures. And then there was this like one second where you're like, ooh, it's a Hellas. And then back to sour beer. Um, and it was neat. Fortunately, it wasn't too thin uh, like I would expect. I mean, it's such a, the ADF on that beer is so high to begin with. And then sitting in the casks for 10 more months. And so being able to play around and do that. And um, we're seeing a lot more of, for instance, oak aged lagers in the US. And so then to be able to kind of put our little fun stamp on it and do an oak aged Hellas. But with the mixed culture in there, you know, create something unique, something different. And being able to play around with that gave us a better idea, okay, 
you know, we can do this the second go around, but maybe we'll do it in these barrels this time, or being able to play around with it. And so I think that's, as I was saying, like with an emerging style, one of the things that's, that's unique and fascinating is you get to really find out how it works for you and your brewery, and also how it's something that, you know, you can either use to educate consumers with, or be able to offer something new in your, your tap room as you bring people in, or to, to bars around town. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just thinking about infecting lines and stuff and, and all those fun <laughs> questions. Uh, actually, so um, this was great. This is a buddy. He was, uh, he's now back in North Carolina. Uh, he's got a brewery called Casita. Uh, and when Ryan was out in the UK, he was brewing for uh, Siren Brewery. Um, they're just outside of London. And his, his going away gift was him and I, we brewed this collaboration beer. And Siren does a lot of Cascale. And they distribute their Cascale. They self-distribute it, distribute it through London. And so we made this beer called All Bretts Are Off. And it used 21 Britannomyces strains. And then they sold it to all the pubs all around London. And I think his thought was that uh, he would try to infect all of the lines <laughs> in the pub system. Yeah, it's pretty good. The truth is, they're, it's the UK, so they're probably all infected to begin with. But <laughs> just kidding. I lived there for a while. It's OK. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I would love to be able to, if, if people have questions, to, to answer questions and be able to talk about it. Otherwise, you just have to listen to me for the rest of the time. Yeah. Uh, so the question was about uh, confidence levels in attenuation levels with Britannomyces, and, and I'll relate that even to you know just wild and sour beer in general. Uh, surprisingly high, actually. Uh, it sounds strange, but for some reason, we always finish at exactly the same place. Uh, the culture even of mix, the mixed culture we have has 200 plus organisms when we've typed it out, including like archaeobacteria and all of these strange bacteria. It's really fascinating. Yet we are producing for production like Britannomyces only beers and also mixed firm beers and then bottle conditioned beers. And when we would do it in the past before we had Anton Parr to be able to look at with uh, the DMA 3500 and always looking at, okay, exactly what we were doing before bottle conditioning, where CO2 levels were, we would always see the same thing. So back then we would always force carb and we would kind of look at where we were and assume that, you know, after six months, always assuming that it was just finished. If it hadn't done it in those six months, that it'd be done. And that actually worked for us all the time. What was more, where we saw more struggle was in doing forced carb on primary fermented Brett beers and getting those in. And that's where we saw stuff, sometimes no problem, sometimes extremely high carb levels. I always aimed low. So, from a carbonation standpoint, and we still do that. So having now had, yeah, I think, the Anton Parr set up for almost four years, it's extremely surprising how consistent stuff is. So we see about 90, 92 for us and for our strains seems to be basically the stopping point. It doesn't, doesn't keep going. So on the Sour Rosé production, for instance, that's like our one of our quickest sours because it takes about three months. And we see that once it's basically, it'll be between um, like 0.9 Play-Doh is where it's just always finishing it every single time. And that basically ADF, the parent degree of fermentation, is between 92 and 91%. And so basically if we hit 90% ADF, we feel really confident that it's really not moving much more. And so what we'll do is we'll run, it's part of our everyday setup. So Sellerman transfer into Bright Tank. We're checking DO the whole time. 
keeping DO as low as possible. And so the um, the quality team's part of that the whole time, checkoffs for you can transfer during transfer, looking at that. And then once we're all in on the bright tank, tanking all the Anton PAR readings, and we send that off for basically the, the packaging team and our sales manager to, to uh, be able to finish what the packaging run is going to look like. Um, but then the team of like our head brewer, myself, our production coordinator, and quality manager all basically will kind of chat back and forth about where we want to take those beers. So on the primary fermented beers where we see the most movement, we're generally, as long as the beer, the beers, it's kind of interesting, even though they'll start at a different original gravity, as long as they get between 1.8 and 1.5 Play-Doh, we'll take them to about 2.1 volumes of CO2 in the can, knowing that if we see nothing else, because that's usually around uh, 85 to 88% ADF, uh, if nothing else, at 2.1, it's on the lower side of carbonated, um, but you're not you're not disappointed as though you got a flat beer. Uh, and again, with a little more acidity in the beer, that helps give the basically the false sense that there is CO2 in the beer, but it's not. It's the acid uh, that you get. And so then we basically just build it so that we're not going to get up above, you know, 2.7. We have seen in the can a couple times things go to three. Uh, but we were we were aware that that was a very good possibility, and so those were ones we set aside. Those went straight into the cold room. Then we made sure they stayed in state, went to the distributor, and stayed like all cold throughout the process, so that they wouldn't go up until probably someone put them in the back of their car. And then <laughs> but we didn't do that. Um, so so yeah, it's kind of the long story. What's really strange is some of the the larger higher gravity sour beers, we always did the same thing and then all of a sudden when we got Anton Parr and we could look at those different measurements, some of these are like 3.5 Play-Doh still left in the beer when we package it. And it's one of those things like more information you have, the more you freak out. So like we can't package this. But then we go back and look at past ones and we're like, wait, this is what we've always been doing. So maybe we can. Okay, let's try it. And then it doesn't even carbonate for other reasons. So then you got to re-bottle condition it. Uh, but yeah, we have a handful, two different beers that get bottle conditioned and they start at three and a half Play-Doh and, and they're, they're done at three and a half Play-Doh and they're 12, 16 months old. Um, so it's it's hard sometimes to trust in trust in your instruments and your measurements when like I'm sure those beers should be going down to one Play-Doh or, or lower. You hear about beers all the time that are like, you know, zero, density of zero, same as water. Um, for us in our culture, it, it's just been surprisingly consistent actually. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we've had bacteria pop up every once in a while. Um, it's kind of funny. Yeah, I'll answer both the question and <laughs> the side tangent. Uh, so yeah, we, we've had bacteria pop up in actually it was a Brett tank, but it wasn't bacteria from our culture, which was really strange. So we tried to keep it alive, uh, and we couldn't. <laughs> it was just like gone after a generation or two. So we must have essentially selected it out. But it's just one of those weird things when you want to keep bacteria. Like, oh, let's try and keep this alive. This will be really cool. I have a low level of acidity in here. Let's keep the, keep the culture. And then, then you can't keep it. But then when you don't want it, it pops up. Uh, so, we, so we've had that happen. Uh, we will actually, we turn tanks over. So. When we first started in that cellar, there was probably like four or five green tanks. So if we're doing like IPA and Pilsner, um, two red sour tanks and another couple of Brett Black tanks. Uh, over time, we produce a lot less Brett beer than we do of Pilsner and IPA. And all the red sour is all produced in the fooder cellar now. So we'll do, we call it a, a double nuke. Uh, we take all the parts off the fermenter they all get autoclaved. So, you know, your, your PRVs, your valves, everything like that. So we autoclave all of those parts, and then we'll do, uh, we'll do like acid before caustic loop, and then we'll go back around and do caustic acid sandy. So we'll basically do uh, at a little bit higher strength than recommended, and we'll just do two in a row. And then we change out all the gaskets, the same thing. Those have either been completely changed out or like fully autoclaved. So 
basically autoclave all parts and, and double clean. And so we'll do that. We've done it with the, even our bright tanks a couple of times uh, as well, and we've had great success. Uh, it's kind of neat. From that, that we know of, from feedback that we've gotten and that we've seen, and we hold, we do beginning, middle, of end of everyone as well, and do micron on those cans, but then save it all and do sensory. So we look at everything then for the next six months and taste stuff, and then it gets held on for another year after that. Uh, one time we got a product back, our Pilsner, and they, it, it traveled really far from us, and it was like, yeah, I had, had your Pilsner, five out of the six were great, and one tasted like a Goza. And we're like, okay, this guy just referenced Goza, so he clearly knows what he's talking about. Because um, otherwise he would just would have said he didn't know why it tasted weird. Um, so we're like, okay, like, let's try this. So we open up the six, and one out of the six was sour. So it was a Von Pilsner, so we called it Von Goza. Um, and yeah, on that one run, Basically, gaskets must have not have gotten changed out on one of the fill heads on the rods on the canning line. Um, so, and at the time, what we were doing was that our ATP method was to like randomly swab one of the one of the down stems, which doesn't make any sense because then you're only checking for one out of six. Now, the way the CIP is done, you, you're swab every single one, but you do it by swabbing the water that's been being used with them. Makes sense. Uh, so yeah, so we made Van Gogh's at one time. Uh, but but it's only one out of six that you get. Um, but yeah, I, I gotta believe that's just changing out a gasket literally on that uh, on the canning line on that one single arm. So that was kind of neat. Um, the funny the funny thing is is uh, we actually just blamed it on the district. Not not to him. We thanked him for for finding it. But it actually gave us a chance to yell at the distributor um, because like in our contracts with them we have that. You know, after 120 days, they're to pick the product up, and it's all stipulated by like you know when we send it to them, when they get it, and how fresh it is and stuff. And this beer was still on the shelf like six plus months later. I think it had been eight months since it had been. So we just turned around and yelled at the distributor like, "Why is there eight month beer on this shelf? That looks bad on us because we weren't able to sell the beer. It looks bad on you not doing your job." Uh, so yeah, we, that was how we turned it around. <laughs> but then we opened. But then we opened up the Von the Von Goza. Uh, so yeah, double. I feel really secure about double CIPs. Um, on the bacteria side of things, you know, if, when you're working in stainless steel, it's nice because you can clean it. It's all the porous parts. So I wouldn't like hoses. Avery Brewing Company for a for a long time, they would switch out the hoses often on their bottling line, um, but they would package clean and sour beer into 12 ounce bottles on the same line. And it's same thing. I mean, they would just run through it hot as water as possible so trying to get that uh, we work with a lot of water like at 85 degrees celsius and trying to hold that and trying to get the equipment up that high but in a in anything that's porous that's really hard because you have organisms that can sort of hide away in those pores and um, yeah might not get the temperature or get those chems so it's hard to see yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question's about uh, the temperature at sparging. That one actually, that is a hard one for me because I look at how people will, um, I mean, you boil, so I get that, and then you transfer it back over, and sometimes you're like trying to get as close to uh, essentially boiling temperature of water that you're sparging with, uh, and I can't wrap my head around how that does not just create the most awful beer. But at the same time, when making, so we do, uh, we do our spontaneous, um, usually November through March when those temps are getting low enough. So we're coming up on that season again. And the whole time you're making that beer, you're, it's actually something where I won't train uh, of the two or three brewers we have. Only one gets to see like the second half of the process because I literally don't want them to know what they can do on the brew house because if they did this for any other beer, I would be so pissed. Because basically... All we do is just make a stuck mash over and over and over again every time we bring it back over. But we drop the rakes, drop the paddle down to the bottom, run the rakes at like, uh, run the VFD for the rakes at like 40 hertz and just beat the crap out of the mash. And then it resets. 
and we're able to sparge and run it back off. If, if we did that for anything else, it'd be like, that's, yeah, I would be really pissed. Um, so yeah, we like, essentially don't want to teach them this process of making the beer. And the whole time you're doing it, you're like, this has got to make the worst beer in the world. Can't believe this is going to create something so, so delicious, you know, so complex, so forward. And yeah, so the sparging at 100 degrees C almost in that temp, um, we don't quite sparge that warm because, yeah, I, I can't understand it. Uh, for sparging at the, the lower temps, I mean, it, it's exactly the reason why. Once you start to get up above, uh, and sometimes I start to get, forget it in Fahrenheit, uh, in, in Celsius, once you start to get above that kind of 75 degrees or so right in there, you really start to pull out the anthocyanidins, right? So the compounds in the husk. And I think you taste it a lot, like in Saccharomyces beers as an example, some of those first oxidative flavors that you start to get, a lot of times those are from really high high mash temps and high sparge temps. So you can pick that out uh, quite often, that husk-like type characteristic in beers. And it's exactly that characteristic that we're trying to stay away from in it because Britannomyces will take that and will produce uh, Band-Aid, um, you know, phenolic type characteristics. I think some some phenols are nice. You can get some light, light smoke, some light... Um, clove, some complementary phenolic characteristics, but I think you get that without really uh, sparging at a real high temperature. Um, so yeah, not the best answer in the difference between kind of this, the way the spontaneous, the lambics are done. Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, we'll, we do it in all beers. <laughs> so that's kind of my, my dogma to make sure that we're not sparging too warm so that even in our IPA and our Pilsners and really delicate beers like that, that we're not getting that characteristic. But I think it's where that whole idea came from for me was trying to keep things down below. So I th it is 78, and so I think it's keeping it at like 76, set at like 2 degrees Celsius below, and just to try to make sure that we don't get that characteristic. And at the end of the day, it, it could honestly be, be dogma. Um, but it'd be really interesting. I know, uh, like Stephen Powell's from uh, Boulevard Brewing Company, when they do their Saison Brett, they mash in lower. They mash in at uh, 145 because he wants to try to get some of those phenolic compounds from like the cumeric acid and those to be able to get a little bit of smoky, get a little bit of phenolic characteristics. So they literally approach that beer the opposite of how I would. I wouldn't want to. I want to sit in a real tight range so that the malt characteristics I get are not going to give me those off flavors, what I consider off flavors. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think, I think malt being one of the largest Percentages of raw materials and the flavor early on in the fermentation. Uh, definitely hops can play with it as well. Hops can be a big influence, but also just strain dependent in fermentations as well. Uh, you know, depending on the strain, you could do everything right and use a Britannomyces strain that's just, for lack of a better term, I'm not even the biggest fan of this term, but a little funky, and you'll get some of those characteristics. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, what it seems like is a synergistic effect from the p cumeric acid and the ferulic acid. So at really low levels, those compounds are probably, so p cumeric acid and the decarboxylation of them. So you have it in uh, POF positive Saccharomyces yeast as an example. So wit yeast, heavy vicin yeast, where ferulic acid and p cumeric acid uh, become, what? Four vinyl glycol and four vinyl phenol. Sorry, not the vinyl derivative. Ooh, I'm going to forget the first one. Oh, yeah, vinyl derivative. Britannomyces then takes it one step further to the ethyl derivative. And those ethyl derivatives are the ones that can be more band-aid, more horsey, and those different characteristics. And they're also, they've got these synergistic effects. So where totally normal to have the, the vinyl, basically, glycol, vinyl, four vinyl glycol, four vinyl phenol in a wit beer or in a heavy vice in wit beer, what Britannomyces then takes those and does is much more extreme. When it's on the less extreme side, it also seems like those are the compounds that are responsible for the lemon kind of rind, 
grapefruit type characteristics as well that you get. So it seems to be a really fine line between getting this lemon rind characteristic and getting like a horse blanket and different characteristics. And it's just those synergistic effects, but all those seem to come from the malt themselves. And then it depends on which strain you use. So some strains don't really have the affinity to produce the, to ethylate them that well. And some that's just all they want to do. So strain dependent the most. second one I'll have to think about, I think. Um, so the question about the redox balance. Yeah, one of the really interesting things when basically trying to look at, and a lot of this was really old information. It was, there hadn't, at the time when I did the dissertation uh, about a decade ago, the research, there was just a few and far between. There was stuff from Clausen from 1904. Uh, there was a research done at Delft in like 1974. There's a little bit of stuff done on Lambic. And as I was kind of reading them all, and then uh, there was a fair amount done in wine research and through pulling them all together and looking at things from THP production and all of that, and also looking at, uh, I believe it's crab tree effect in Britannomyces, but then being able to see that like, Britannomyces can primary ferment and it can do these, these steps, these dioxic growth curves, and trying to think where those came from and what it was, what I started to look at was, as I looked at the whole alcohol fermentation process and all the way through, one of the biggest things is that, that redox. So, uh, Na, NADH plus to NADH minus, and being able to go through that is basically the step that keeps Saccharomyces fermenting the way that it does, and it does that through the production of glycerol. Coincidentally, a lot of the complaints about Britannomyces beers is that it's flabby, and when you look at glycerol production from Britannomyces, it's like non-existent. So it seems like the, the true characteristic in Britannomyces not being able to primary ferment is because in its, in its metabolites and production, it's not, produce, it's not that step, it's not producing that glycerol, which is not there for restoring that redox balance back to the NADH plus, to be able to continue all the way through that alcohol fermentation process through all those metabolites. So I'm not sure if that's like, yeah, where in the cycle and stuff that is, that it would produce that as well. Uh, and so what's interesting though is there's other compounds that can, can play that role as well, uh, diacetyl being one of them. It's not a bad idea. Um, interestingly enough, I don't know the exact mechanism or why, but it seems like botanum, different strains of botanomyces are able to do it on their own. Maybe not uniformly, um, but somehow they're able to, to overcome it. And I think part of it is sort of an, an acclimation phase. One of the reasons why Britannomyces was said to ferment and produce acetic acid stronger than producing alcohol was that when it was being looked at, it wasn't being looked at from a brewer's perspective. It was being looked at from like, okay, in 10 minutes, here's what happens. When we feed it tons of oxygen, it does this, but it won't start to ferment. So it's, it's different than Saccharomyces and how quickly, but we're not used to fermentations taking off in 10 minutes. You know, it's, that's the next day. Well, it can be hours later, but still. So Britannomyces is slower, like a longer lag phase, but does seem to, some of the strains eventually get there. Um, but I just, I do think about it from the stance sometimes like, oh, diacetyl production, oh, that'll just help the bread along. Uh, second one, stuff that kind of influenced me, is that the way I put it, or just resources? Uh, I was going to say drinking beer in the UK. Uh, I wish. I, you could get Belgian beer. No, it was like, that was like 10, 12 years ago. The, the industry in the UK is phenomenal now. It's amazing to, to watch where it went. Um, but it, 10 years ago, it was uh, less. Amazing Cascale. Um, but if you were into craft beer, it was pretty hard to find. Um, or hops as well. Um, but that's... That's the American in me. Um, so yeah, so no, from a, from a biochemical standpoint, uh, you know, Google Scholar and being able to kind of look stuff up. It was a lot of the Britannomyces articles. Some of it was wine stuff. Some of it was reading things that I knew wasn't correct, but yet like there was no science 
literature around it. So that kind of really spurred me. When I told my professors at Harriet Watt that I wanted to study Britannomyces, they just looked at me like, this stupid American. Um, like, we've worked for so long to get rid of that, and now you want to study it? Um, turns out it wasn't that bad of an idea. And so that, I think, proven my, some of my professors wrong. Uh, definitely spurred me. But research along the way, reading about the genome and stuff that was coming out, about how, how diverse it was, what the lineage was and the parents for it, a lot of those things. Uh, there was good research in, in the wine industry, but it was all about the negative aspects of Britannomyces. So a lot kind of spurred me to look at what the positive aspects could be in going along the way. And the fact that there was some really old research done from, from Lambic beer and those, I'm trying to think of some of the more kind of modern stuff now that is out. Even though brewing science doesn't change a lot, you know, you can still look at, at uh, technical books from 50 years ago, and that's that's brewing. It's still there. It's kind of like what you make out of it. I know in the last 10 years, though, there's been there's been more. There's been more uh, that comes out, especially as uh, the academic side of it and from a craft brewing standpoint starts to become much more relevant. That was the thing that was really interesting 10 years ago was, uh, it's, I mean, it's still really this way, but 95% of research was all uh, aimed for large lager breweries and within those processes. So being able to take those and try to apply it on a whole different level was, was kind of tricky. Uh, so yeah, many things to get along the way, I guess. Yeah. I think you see it from a standpoint of how it how it cleans it up. It's not something that I've ever been able to to measure, you know, to be because it's like every every barrel is different or beer is different, and so for me it's a lot of uh, a hypothesis. Like, okay, I believe that Brett's doing a really good job being able to clean this up if it's being produced because we see it we see it like rear its head at times. Uh, we used to see it a long time ago, especially with packaging the mixed firm beers at like the six week mark, and we would see like four weeks in just huge, huge spike. Uh, we were bottling on a line that put a lot of oxygen into the beer, and it's one of the reasons why we bottle condition now. Um, in the beginning, I thought, oh, we won't bottle condition because we've aged the beer for all this time, and when we bottle condition, we're just setting it back, and then we have to wait, and then we have to hold it. Well, what we learned anyways is when we weren't bottle conditioning, all of a sudden, we were having these diacetyl compounds like that, and there wasn't enough like really healthy yeast to clean it up quickly so it would take four, six, eight weeks to clean that kind of diacetyl up. So I believe the same thing's going on in the barrels. Uh, no, we use a champagne yeast that we bottle condition with, but all the organisms are, are still there, and there's definitely still Brett alive even 12, 16 months later. So it's, it's there. keeps it going. How are we doing on time? I guess we're great. We can just keep going. Yeah. Um, personal favorite. I like the strain that, that we use is very similar to um, a strain from the Brewing Science Institute called Dre. I noticed that the Britannomyces strains it's kind of kind of fitting that they're wild. Um, they change. They change morphologically. So if you're working with the same one and culture it, I'll see over time them change. There might be three, two, three different morphologies, and especially giant colony morphologies that form. Whether those I've talked to a couple of people like geneticists about this, whether that is just a gene expression, whether there's mating or breeding going on. I, I'm not sure. It's actually really cool. I would like to know the answer to it. And so one of these sort of uh, morphologies that we have from the Dre strain is really citrusy. Uh, it doesn't primary ferment quite as well uh, from, a, from a speed standpoint, but it's not the speed or the time that we're looking for. It's, it's the aroma and the flavor. And that's really just kind of a basis of, of my preference. I love citrus, tropical fruit type characteristics, whether it's in an IPA or a sour beer. Um, or kombucha, or you name it, is that that citrusy, tart, citrusy, you know, tropical characteristics. So, breath strains that I would look for are going to kind of show off more, like more wine-like type, like white wine type characteristics. So dry, produced 
producing dry, uh, minerality, floral, citrusy, tropical type characteristics. Uh, I have not cultured up any new Britannomyces strains in a long time. Uh, I should start doing that again. We have the lab now. What happens is, what happened for me at least, is I kind of got to a point where I had, there's another one that we really like that produces uh, stone fruit characteristics. And we get a lot of apricot and peach like type fermentation characteristics in our beers. And those are my favorite, peaches are my favorite fruit to work with in, in beer in general, especially sour beer. Um, so I like that. And so basically we just wanted to focus on those two and learn as much about them as possible. And it is something I would recommend. I mean, it's great to be able to experiment and, and use these different strains. But at some point, it becomes about wanting to know the most, like kind of about those ones and kind of basically saying, okay, we're all in with these. And that's really what we've, we've done. And so I haven't been collecting. I used to collect wine that had Brett in it, all sorts of stuff. And it's still sitting there waiting to be cultured. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you.